Uh, thank you all for coming. Have you got the X factor? So let's talk a little bit about inspiration. Uh, in a previous career, I was unfortunate enough to work on a large Java app. Um, these apps are, by the measure of a mix app, humongous, and they pretty much necessitate, the, necessitate an IDE. Uh, at the same time, I was fortunate enough to work with IntelliJ as my IDE. Uh, and for anyone who has uh, had this experience before, I want to just warn you, the next slide may be mildly upsetting. So IntelliJ is fantastic and has a, a number of really great features. One of them that I miss is called the is refactor function. Basically, it allows you to point at a function and tell, ask IntelliJ to move it to a new class, and it'll update all the references and handle that for you automatically. <clears throat> so uh, with this feature and others, I would go so far as to say IntelliJ makes Java work tolerable. And given that IntelliJ makes Java work tolerable, maybe Java's not that bad. Maybe jo working in Java has been unfairly maligned. Maybe it's time to reconsider Java. I'm going to take a page from Mark Venturelli's book, He's going to give, we're going to give the secret title. In his, in his uh, case, it was Why NFTs Are Stupid, but in Portuguese. We're going to lock the sponsors out and spend the next 40 minutes on the JVM. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Christian Cook. I'm an engineer with cars.com. We work in Elixir, uh, and I'm here to talk to you all about, OK, not the JVM. Um, but we do have this refactor function feature that we just described, and we want to replicate it. Uh, can we do that with Elixir? I hope so, or else this talk could get more awkward. So let's set some goals. Uh, I use the command line for, uh, as much as I can, so we'll, we'll establish that as our interface. We're only going to need to move one function at a time. We are going to write a library, and we don't want our library to bring in any dependencies, so we'll only use what's available to us in core Elixir. And we don't need to concern ourselves with efficiency. Uh, it seems pretty unlikely we would ever need to use this tool in production to manipulate code at scale. But if that's your use case, then come talk to me, because that sounds wild, and I love it. <laughs> so we've got goals. So what do we need to do to actually change code? Uh, so we need to find, find where our module's called, find where our function's called, move it from one module to another, update some references, rinse and repeat, um, and let's figure out together how many of these we can solve uh, in the time permitting. So to find our module, find our function. Actually, step zero, we need to find where our module is called. So Elixir has a built-in tool to identify the callers of any, of any, any given module. Uh, it's xref. So at, with xref, we can narrow down the list of targets from all the modules to a relevant subset. We still need to determine if the function we're interested in, in changing is present in that subset. If we look at the documentation for xref, it reveals a function that might help, but it's due for deprecation and removal. And since we don't want to rely on a function that's on its way out, thus pinning our library to a soon-to-be old version of Elixir, we won't use this. Uh, but code compilation tracers looks like a promising breadcrumb, so we can look there next. And full disclosure, uh, early versions of xFactor did make heavy use of the calls function. So compilation tracers provide a hook into Elixir compilation. The trace2 callback gets invoked for every compilation event that gets emitted. And this could be useful for helping us to identify the local and remote function calls that we're interested in refactoring. 
as an aside, uh, getting a compilation tracer to work properly was surprisingly difficult. I mean, conceptually, a tracer is pretty simple. Recall our example. It just implements a two-arity trace function. But writing text that needs to get compiled so you can use it to trace the compilation of your code represents a bit of a mechanical difficulty about where do you even put this code. And if you want to consolidate the results of your trace somewhere, other than standard out, then that's another layer of the onion that we need to get coordinated correctly. And we'll, we'll come back to this point later. So now we can find, we can use one or more of this, these techniques to find our, the module that we want to refactor. Under the hood, XREF is using the code module and compiling our application, which is hopefully not uh, a surprising revelation, but it is, rele it is relevant to our next digression. Let's talk about compilation. How does Elixir actually compile your code? To be more specific, how does a text file get compiled into bytecode? I'm so glad you asked that, straw person. Um, so we start with source code. We have uh, macros get expanded and metaprogramming gets metaprogrammed, which then gets converted into Erlang's abstract format, which can convert to core Erlang and then into Beam bytecode. And spoiler, the Erlang abstract format may be relevant for us. Compilation has two main entry points, the mix task and the code module. But eventually, they make calls into Elixir, which is an Erlang module in the Elixir namespace. Or, to put it another way, Elixir calls Elixir to get your Elixir into Elixir. Elixir isn't executing Elixir in Elixir. It's executing Erlang to evaluate your Elixir. Glad I could clear that up for you all. OK, so Elixir, the Erlang module, uses strings quoted five, which calls into the Elixir tokenizer, which is what's doing a lot of the heavy lifting in converting text into tokenized tuples. What's a tokenized tuple, I hear you asking? Uh, just you wait. We'll talk about that momentarily. Uh, back to the Elixir module, uh, tokens to quoted returns the just mentioned uh, tokenized tuples and makes use of the parse functions in Elixir parser.yrl, raised voice inflection question mark? I have never seen a YRL file before. And if you open up Elixir parser.yrl, you may note that it looks a bit different from other Erlang files. It also doesn't explicitly export a parse function. Uh, I think this, is, this file is formally doing some of the work of defining the grammar of Elixir. Uh, but if I'm honest, this is a bit beyond my skill level. And there's definitely some indirection that's relied on here. So getting lost makes a good place to end our compilation detour. I only promised a medium depth dive. And if we keep going, well, we might drown. So knowing all the steps in the compilation process, the you know, strings to source to bytecode, isn't really necessary. Um, but it is helpful to understand what's going on and have, have some, know where the highlights in the process are. Personally, I also think it's valuable to open up files that you may rely on every day, but without ever actually looking at. So to recap, we can find the module we want to change. And with the results of our compilation trace, we can determine the functions that are called uh, and possibly even where they are. So let's turn to actually manipulating our source code. There are a number of ways we can manipulate text files. There are some great command line tools that can help us out here. But we're sticking with Elixir, so they're out. Uh, there are some naive implementations that would also work. But what if we have an, an ambiguously named function? Here we have two calls to my func. Would we be able to disambiguate these two calls with only regular expressions? Maybe. Uh, if, we're Perl, if we're Perl programmers, then almost certainly. Um, but what happens if we want to move public to? What needs to happen to the private function myfunc? What if public to has a spec and a doc block? Specs carry a name token that matches our function, but a doc block is only related by adjacency. Um, hopefully, you can see how we might run into limitations with variations on find and replace. What we need is a more formal representation of our source code, one that can help smooth out the variation in representation across, across different styles and authorship, which brings us to 
the abstract syntax tree. Now, an AST is not unique to Elixir. In many languages, the AST is just an intermediate representation of source. It's one of several uh, transformations on the road to bytecode. Recall the Erlang abstract format I mentioned earlier. In Elixir, it serves a similar transitional role, but it's available to you, the engineer, uh, with the quote macro and the string to quoted family of functions. And to be completely pedantic, Elixir's abstract syntax uh, is not the same thing as Erlang abstract format, but we don't want to go any further than the Elixir AST, so we don't need to worry about the differences between Elixir's and Erlang's abstract expressions. But the AST expression is well suited to our use cases. It homogenizes all the variations and nuance of source code into a simpler three tuple expression syntax. Recall the tokenized tuple I mentioned previously? In this trivial, in this trivial example, we can see we have a tuple with a token, the, the plus symbol, uh, and two arguments. Every expression in Elixir gets decomposed into a three tuple consisting of token, metadata, and arguments. Asterisk, not every. Um, some types and two element tuples uh, don't get expanded uh, for technical reasons, but again, we can ignore this for today. So if we make the example slightly more complex, we can see that one of our arguments is now itself an expression. It's turtles all the way down. And to belabor the point a bit more, the expression can also be represented as a tree. So returning to some example code, let's see what happens when we convert this to an AST. That's beautiful. I, I quit. I don't think we need to do any more. We should just all write code this way, right? It's a beautiful slide. It's very easy to read. But there is a lot of information in this mess of text. The tree nature of the decomposition can help us to identify neighbors, code that shares the same level of a branch in the tree. And if we change the way we represent this tree, the level relationship may become more, slightly more apparent. And the expressions belonging to the block that comprise the body of our functions can also be detected, which is also visible in our tree. Uh, and just a brief side note, it's surprisingly difficult to find a way to pretty print a tree. I had to use Python to do this. Python. OK. Despite looking unfamiliar, the AST expression is very well suited to our use cases. It simplifies the variation and nuance of source code into this expression syntax. We can determine information about nesting and block membership by relying on the topology of the AST as opposed to trying to grok the boundaries of a block based on white space or some other heuristic. Using compilation tracing tools, we, uh, we know which modules we need to change. And from the AST of the same module, we can identify the functions that we want to change. Uh, in Elixir, the AST expression typically relies on some version of a fully qualified call. Function calls to modules typically rely on dot syntax. And not any value is valid in the first position of the tuple. Here, the dot token combined with the aliases token is a pattern that sends a signal that this is application code, as opposed to a core module like map or kernel. Uh, the token for the outer AST is itself an AST of the dot call to module.myfunk. And the module reference uses the aliases token. This pattern of token and qualif uh, qualification pat excuse me, pattern of token and qualifications can help us identify calls to application code. Aliases, the token, also works well with the as keyword, which itself relies on the aliases token. And we can rely on arguments to count the arity of the function. Now, this is not ideal, uh, as default values are not captured here. And there are some cases where this definitely may not work out for us. But again, we're trying to find a place to kind of get through to start. So we'll, 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 go, we'll go from here and see where we end up. <laughs> 
So we started with source, and now we're able to find a module function in Arity anywhere. We are well on our way. To do the actual work of recursing through our AST, the macro module has some relevant functions that will help us out. Traverse, pre-walk, and post-walk. These functions are all variations on depth-first reductions, which gives us a means of pattern matching the relevant leafs in the AST tree. And while we're on the topic of pattern matching, don't forget to go to my colleague Elaine's talk uh, today, 425 in the Adams Ballroom. So, what do we have so far? We can find the call locations of the module. We can find the locations where our function is called. We can find block level neighbors like specs and docs. And we can disambiguate between remote and local function calls. So we found the AST of the function we want to refactor. Can we use any of our AST techniques to update the source code from this abstract syntax tree? No, maybe, not really. But why, I hear you asking. So while an AST is a good one-way manipulation of source code to bytecode, it's not the same going the other way. More generally, compilation itself is not a uniformly reversible process and also involves irreversible transformations, uh, ideally in a, in a way that has no changes on the behavior of the underlying code. Um, and then more formally, we can say that compilation lacks the property of commutativity. For our concerns, though, maybe it's good enough? Maybe the trade-offs are worth it. We're already making changes, so we're offering an implicit promise of changes, white space included. Um, there's also the Elixir, help, uh, the Elixir formatter, which can help smooth out some of the white space changes. Likewise with parens, uh, we want the code to work the same, but it doesn't necessarily have to look the same. But as an engineer who writes a lot of comments, I don't want to drop them if we can avoid it. So let's see how far we can get with an AST-based approach. So recall, this is the AST we created earlier using the quote macro. But what if we add more context? We can use string to quote it with comments and specify options for line, column numbers, and token metadata. We can find a function block as an AST. We have line numbers to help identify location within the source file. And comments, also with line numbers. This is getting close to something we can use. Um, maybe we can. Maybe we can use the AST. We're going to try, at least. But how can we use it? Um, so macro to string does more or less what the name describes. We can take a block of abstract syntax expression, uh, which represents our function, and convert it to a string, like so. Now that we have a function, we need to insert it into a file. Um, so this sequence of reading a file, writing at a specific line, and then writing the change is very doable. And I am sure there is an answer that describes this exact problem on Stack Overflow. So we'll assume that file manipulation is something we can do. But we don't want to forget about comments. So again, we know where the comment lies in the original file. And we know where our function definition starts. And we know on what, on what line the comment originates. The do token defines the block of the function and we know where the body of the function gets expanded. There's a nuance uh, be about the slight difference between end versus end of expression. Um, but we'll kind of gloss over that. They're not always going to be the same thing. But as long as we're aware that some functions may not have both, value, both keys present with a value in every AST. So given that we know where the function begins and ends and where the, the comment lies, um, 
we can say if the comment falls inside of our function, then we can move it. And if it falls outside of our function, then I don't think there's a good way to determine if it should move. But we'll, let's leave a breadcrumb for the function and the comment we're moving. We'll also mark it our library and remind you that it was X factor that did this. So adding the function to a new module is done. We can update the status of this story. And removing is just adding in reverse. So we can mark that story as a duplicate ticket. But what about moving code to a module that doesn't exist yet? Uh, well, we'll have to create it for you. And fortunately, xFactor can do this. It will infer a path based on the module name provided or use a path value in the event your module doesn't follow typical pathing conventions. So we moved the function, uh, but what about all the places in the code that are referencing the function using the previous name? Changing module names generally captures a lot of what makes a library like this complicated. There are just so many edge cases. Uh, there are issues, the issues are variations on the questions of handling aliases in this specific case. Do I change one or more aliases? Do I change all the references within the file? Is the function imported or is the module required? And does that change any of the downstream behaviors? In some ways, this represents the larger challenges of this kind of work and highlights the difficulties of static code analysis. There's more than one way to get the exact same results, even if we're only talking about module function and arity and not concerning uh, intentionally, not considering intentionally obfuscated code. So we can rely on our abstract syntax and compilation traces to help determine if the function is referenced from an alias, an import, or a require. And really the challenge is making it easy in the library to create exemptions and defining our limits to what this library is going to do. Otherwise, there's little enough end to what we can consider refactoring. And while there is some nuance in getting this right, let's assume that we'll sort out the difficulties. Let's try to use some example code in Anger. This is the live demo portion of the, of the talk, so hang on, everybody. <laughs> Okay, so we have, uh, this is sort of a vanilla, um, this is an umbrella app, and it has no changes. So if we run a mix, a mix x factor command, and we provide some new arguments for it, something happened. Uh, so we have some output that tells us an addition was made to a certain file and a removal was made to another file. And our git status seems to reflect that. If we diff, we see our function got removed and we left a breadcrumb comment. And in our new file, it got moved. We put it in the new one. Yay! Whew. A live demo went reasonably well. Okay. Um, so there's the GitHub and the hex docs for the, the package, which, which is up. It's been published. It's available. We live demoed. Yay! <laughs> so. Despite these modest successes, there is still some work to do uh, in our library to get it to refactor code, which we'll talk about in a minute. But first, um, one of the goals we set out at the beginning of this talk was to only rely on core language features. And while the compiler related, the compilation related code is, is newer to me and has been pretty nice to work with, another bit of Elixir that I used for the first time in this project was Option Parser. It's very nice. It's very simple. 
It converts CLI, shell style options into a type enforced keyword list. It's probably something you don't need to use very often, but it is very nice that it is a part of core Elixir, and kudos to the team for including this in the language. So previously, I mentioned testing. Um, and getting compilation tracers to work itself was a challenge. It's even harder when you're trying to write tests for that. So imagine we have a library, and we're trying to use a tracer on our code to write tests that need to manipulate and then compile the source code and then trace that compilation. But in order to evaluate the test, we need to compile the code. <laughs> so it's a real dilemma. And ultimately, it's one I kind of punted on. I used a, a VCR style approach, if anyone's familiar with the Ruby gem, sort of a pre recorded trace approach. So I took a lot of inspiration from a blog post written by Wojtek Mach on uh, his import to alias tool and created a mixed task which compiles the app with a tracer and stores the result in an agent. And then we write the results into an artifact that we can use later during testing. So now in, in this example, we use Elixir to compile one file that sits outside of the application tree and then invoke the mixed task that gets generated. And the compiled on-demand trace stores the results of co the compilation trace. And then we can use this later during testing. So to recap, conceptually, we mostly used the ASTs and compilation tracers to provide information about our code and to identify locations, both file and line, uh, of the modules and the functions that we want to move. The abstract syntax tree helped us define the qualified calls to our function. And while we do end up using the AST blocks to recreate the code when we move, uh, ultimately, that's an implementation detail and one that we could change without too much difficulty. We did end up using a variation of find and replace in many places in X Factor. It was just find and replace that was well informed by metadata provided by both Elixir's abstract syntax and compilation tracing. Setting a goal of, of using only core Elixir could have made this more challenging, but there is a lot in Elixir. It's like we're at a conference about the language or something. I was pleasantly enough surprised by how far I was able to get using nothing more than the existing language tools. There's nothing in the tools that would prevent X Factor from working better and more reliably. It's really just a question of defining where these behaviors end and, what the edge, and identifying all the edge cases. So let's recap. Let's see how we did. We have a mixed task and a command line interface. We even use option parser to enforce our arguments. We can only move one function at a time. I did add one dependency to the mix file, xdoc. But we only need that so we can publish uh, to hex docs. And I did make this requirement as soft as op and, and as optional as I could figure out how to do. And as far as don't worry about as do, don't worry about efficiency as a goal, we nailed it. There are many places where this code is inefficient. <laughs> so all in all, I'd say this is B minus work today. I think A level work is in reach. You gotta, you gotta be fair. You gotta, I think that's a fair assessment, but we need to do a little bit more first. So where do we go from here? Um, one thing I mentioned at the beginning was handling dependent private functions. So we're not doing that yet, so that's just sorting that out. Uh, likewise, dependent types. If we're moving specs, dependent types are a problem we need to deal with. Um, and then determination on those, those dependent elements, types and private functions, should they get moved or should they get copied? My colleagues uh, have suggested Elixir LS integration. I don't even know how that would work, so that's a <laughs> huge research project. Uh, and then covering some additional edge cases. So that's it. Thank you.